Hello and welcome to another episode of Earth 911's Sustainability in Your Ear. I'm Mitch Ratcliffe, your host, and we're having another innovator interview, this time with author Tom Brown Jr., who with uh, Randy Walker Jr. has just written a book called Tom Brown's Guide to Healing the Earth. Uh, Tom has uh, comes to this uh, question of the environment from a very interesting perspective, and Welcome to the show, Tom. I want to ask you to begin with telling us how you met Stalking Wolf, Wolf and who Stalking Wolf was and how he influenced your view of the world. Well, Stalking Wolf was uh, um, my best friend's actual great-grandfather, mm-hmm. who was a, a full-blooded uh, lip on Apache from the Southwest. And uh, <clears throat> when I was seven, I had met him through Rick, my best friend. And, um, he, uh, uh, stalking wolf was 83 at the time. Mm-hmm. And uh, I grew up in the woods, you know, right on the edge of the vast pine lands of New Jersey and, uh, stalking wolf, or we call him grandfather, um, uh, was, he had his camp very close to where Rick lived. So every day, practically without fail, we would go and visit him and learn from him. And this took place for over nearly 11 years, three months shy of 11 years. Where I grew up, there wasn't much to do. I wasn't interested in anything that uh, the other kids were doing. And uh, to me, I had an insatiable appetite for all things that were Native American, survival, tracking, awareness, all of that. So here's my teacher, you know, and, and he became my best friend and, uh, Rick and I just every moment we had, we were doing something with him, but he had a passion for not only passing down the old ways, the skills, Mm -hmm. but also for saving the earth. He, he knew back then in the fifties that, um, you know, we were in rough shape and, um, and, uh, he kind of, drum that into our heads and showed us examples of how um, the little things done to the earth can have such grave consequences, you know, that kind of thing. So it was a visual as well as a, a, um, a, a verbal lesson, you know. Now, you, you took that experience and, 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 and made that your career in a way. You, you, you've taught at tracker school and you, you specialize in finding lost people and people who are hiding as well. On the other yeah. hand, you're, you're teaching survival skills both uh, in the tracking school and in some uh, different communities around the world where you take folks to, to do that kind of, of work. How, do, how does that, that view of, of the wilderness as a place that can enclose and hide us change your perspective on the way that we think about life today? Or you, you, you hit on not only the, the harm that you can do to the earth, but the things you can do for it to help it uh, throughout. Your oh, book, absolutely. Uh, for instance, talking about making the wilderness healthier for animals and, 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 and others. Yeah, we've moved from the place of being caretakers to that we have to be healers. In other words, mm-hmm. we have to take a, a very strong, more proactive approach to saving what we can that is left of the earth. But survival, when you go out there with nothing, and I mean nothing, you have got to take everything from the earth. And it's, you know, there's two schools of thought in survival. Those people that take things randomly and just butcher the earth, and then those people who take things that need to be taken out of the equation Mm -hmm. to balance out the landscape. And I look at survivalists as healers of the earth because we can do things in short order that nature can't do for herself in, in, in decades. And survival, if you make a mistake, you could be very close to death and you start to ver- cherish the very plants and animals that walk this and live on this earth with you that you don't want to do any damage. You want everything that you do to be um, healing so that you leave a legacy of love and compassion for future generations, not one that's butchered and sick. And, now you're, you know, that's the beauty of it. And you focus on these small acts of caretaking. Can you give us a, an example of one that you've recently adopted as you've been learning about the earth? I'm, it must be continuing. You know, I believe, like the Native Americans believe, that there's a spirit that moves in and through all things. And no matter what we do, we send out a concentric ring, whether it be positive or negative. And 
you know, just by way of, for instance, going back a few years, I gave a lecture over at a, uh, a gathering that was in the Pinelands. And I, I, I talked for about an hour about awareness and the earth and things like that. And when I was all done, we were out in an area where there's a lot of vendors and stuff. And it was a wind blowing, you know, and I had my Cody at the time. My son was only about three years old and I had him in my arms and a hot dog wrapper blew across the lawn. Well, he kicked to me and, you know, daddy, let me down, let me down and mm -hmm. ran over and grabbed that paper. And as he grabbed that paper on his way to the garbage can, he he grabbed more and more and more until his little hands couldn't hold anymore and threw it in the garbage. Well, I'm watching the people watching him. And all of a sudden, everybody's picking up paper. And here's a little three-year-old that started the whole ball rolling, so to mm -hmm. speak, not a word. And I think he reached more people in that five minutes act of kindness and cleaning than, than I did in an hour. But he, I, as I tell everybody, look, you're in the middle of the woods, nobody's around and you see a straw or a, a discarded can or, a, you know, a glass or whatever that's been thrown down. If you pick that up and carry it out with you, nobody sees it. You still send out a concentric ring that is felt. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the examples I give, you know, you're you're stuck in traffic, you know, it's slow moving and there's people trying to get out into the traffic. You know how frustrating that is. So nobody's letting them out. And then just do this. Let that person out. Give them a mm -hmm. wave and a smile and then watch what they do. It'll they'll return the favor to another one and another one and all, another one. You watch it go down the line. And it's that consciousness that, that makes such a big difference. And that's, you know, people look at the environment and all the problems that we face and are facing more every day. And they get overwhelmed to a point of paralysis. What can one person do if everybody could just do one little thing, pick up a piece of paper, you know, plant a tree, whatever, it would make a huge difference. There's an example we give in the book about um, uh, a, a man who plants trees every day mm -hmm. and brought back a community from the brink of nearly extinction and got the whole community involved in it. Like a kind of like a, a Johnny Appleseed in a way, you know, that old parable. So it, it, really what you're saying is survival skills are contributing skills. Uh, that they yes, are giving exactly. to the world, and and by doing so, that we're we're creating a a positive force that does sustain and heal the earth. Yes, How, it's, you know, it's not like being a gardener, though. You know, where you want everything in order, okay. and like that, we're like a city park where there's trees and lawn, and that's it. It's mm -hmm. just different. This is uh, where you're making sure things are balanced and uh, the right plants and the right animals, and there's not an overabundance of one or the other, that kind of thing. So let me ask you this. Is, is modern life a good idea in retrospect? Uh, yes and no. Uh, there's ways of going about things. If people just would question everything they did and uh, are doing or plan to do with the earth in mind, but better more than the earth, the children and our grandchildren in mind, mm -hmm then we could make adjustments to try to stem the tide, so to speak. Uh, you know, an analogy I give is, you know, you're in a kayak and you're, hit, and you're just drifting along in, a, in fairly quiet water, but there's rapids up ahead. And one side is real heavy rapids. The other is, you know, moderate rapids. And you're right in the middle of it. All you have to do is dangle your fingers in that water for a few moments. And all of a sudden, the kayak turns to the less aggressive rapids. Mm -hmm. If we could make those adjustments now, we're making it better for our children in the future. Simple little things that we can do, like planting a tree or, uh, or putting more insulation in a house and making more eco-friendly, for instance, and focus on that. We're 
a world that is overpopulated um, and diseases are starting to run rampant as grandfather said they would. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's going to start attacking our livestock, our crops, our cells and everything else. Storms are intensifying. This is a, you know, when you look at the whole of it, it's, it's almost paralyzing, but if you can just do one little thing, no matter what it is to make it better, even to plant a seed, it's going to make a, a lot of difference in the future. So the thing that I was struck by in reading was we use one particular tool extensively, and that is various forms of captured energy. We started with fire. Now it's electricity, burning fossil fuels to generate power, so forth. How do you see changing our reliance on energy as a critical lever for improving the condition of the world? Oh, exactly. That's why I believe firmly we have to take and pour more into research and development of alternative methods and um, stop looking at them as a cliche or, you know, like a, a flavor of the month type mm -hmm. of thing. Um, and taking even if everybody just took the basic little steps in, in improving where they live, like um, infrared, take an infrared picture of your house in the winter mm -hmm. and see where the leaks are, you know, and then, you know, get, get it insulated. You, you wouldn't believe how many houses you can drive by with a, after a snow, snowstorm and see the snow melting off the roof, not sure. from external heat, but from internal and uh, these things, if everybody did something like that, imagine how much could be saved. And then, of course, uh, the, 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 the research and everything else that should go into it. But we got to take a cold, hard look at our lives and, uh, you know, make adjustments because we are really hurting our children and grandchildren in a big way. Now, you, you and your co-author spend a good deal of time talking about examples in the environment, uh, such as the way mm -hmm. that squirrels or voles or mouse uh, uh, dens are made. Uh, what right. would you say a couple of ideas for just, you mentioned uh, insulation, but what are a couple of other ideas that I could uh, apply today to reduce my energy consumption based on your experience? You know, I just, for me personally, you know, we, live in a society where it's uh, every, we've got to drive every place. Mm -hmm. And I start to rethink that. And I say, can I, instead of driving, can I bike it? You know, with safely and you're mm -hmm. trying to find a safe bike path today is like oh, nearly impossible in a lot of areas. But still, if I can make a choice, whether to walk or drive, I'll walk. Um, and then I, when I buy food, I will buy that that has the most biodegradable, the least amount of carbon footprint to it. It's just those are the little things that can be done. I will make sure that the house I live in is is insulated properly. Um, I'll, I'll, in the wintertime, when things get really bad, we'll confine our movements to the more center portion of the house and then drop the heat in the other areas of the mm -hmm. house so that it's not eating up so much energy it, it, it's it's staggering it, when you think about the mass amount of people just a mass amount of waste you don't see it in one person or one family because it's you're too close to it but when you back up and see 20,000 30,000 people doing one little thing to insulate their house better Mm -hmm. or take advantage of the uh, light coming from the east and the rising sun, so to speak, to warm the house through the windows, opening the shutters and stuff like that, or the shades, I should say. Um, that would make a monumental change, you know, with that staggering number of people. You know, so I, the idea that uh, comes to mind is thinking about being with you when you begin tracking someone or something. You step back mm -hmm. and you look at the big picture, but you're also looking for the small details that give you the exactly. initial orientation. Grandfather uh, said you move your eyes from the minute to the majestic and back again and keep it going like that, like a rhythm, a tide, a cadence. So you're picking up the big picture, but yet you're getting to the small detail. And you find that there's a personality that develops uh, uh, in the track. Like like grandfather said, an animal or a human is an instrument played by the landscape 
and you mm-hmm. start reading instead of the individual track, the entire landscape, and you know which way that person's going to go. Oh, okay, uh, so it, it it is like reading different kinds of music in the environment, and they're changing one another through their interaction. Yeah, exactly. Hmm. Wow. Now, tell us a little more about Tracker School. What what happens when one attends Tracker School? Well, uh, Tracker School just had its 40th anniversary last year. Uh, sole proprietorship, me, I guess. Mm-hmm. And uh, I, you know, I teach. I uh, uh, still. Uh, we have over a hundred levels, different levels of education that a person can go through. No repeat, no uh, review, just all new information. But let's take a standard class, which is the people's favorite class. I take them through survival Mm -hmm. so that they can go into any wilderness in the world with nothing and survive and, and survive like it's the garden of Eden, not the starvation that you see, you know, on television, um, for instance, my top level of survival, which is called the expert, is 28 days in the Bob Marshall Wilderness of Montana in the dead of winter. That's, you know, January. My students gain an average of four pounds during that class. It really? pisses a lot of people off, you know, yeah. But then you get this television show where they're on an island in that South China Sea, the cornucopia of survival living, and they're losing weight and sniveling. And mm-hmm. the difference is the skill. I take them through that kind of survival. I teach them how to track. I, I tell them, I will teach you in this week to track a mouse across a gravel driveway. And they do. And then I teach them awareness and I teach them the philosophy of living with the earth, which brings it all together. You see, and that's the standard class. And that shoots off into the philosophy classes, the um, uh, advanced survival, expert survival, that kind of thing. But I usually, um, you know, I I have a number of instructors that I've trained that come and help me out. And uh, and their students are in there for a week. I start them off easy. They're in their tents, their sleeping bags, and their teddy bears and whatever else. And then the next class up, called the advanced standard, I take all that away from them because they know how to build their own shelter and everything else, you know, that kind of thing. But it's fun. They Their total concept of the earth changes. There's no more wilderness. Wilderness becomes home to them. And it's right. a great feeling. Now, uh, how how would people find out how to attend Tracker School? Easy. Just go to the internet, trackerschool.com. And uh, now, you've got some great, great video there. It's just one word, tracker school, and then dot com. And, and uh, now your book, Tom Brown's Guide to Healing the Earth, is out now. It's uh, from uh, uh, Penguin Random House. Uh, what are people yeah, going to get when well, they read the book? Hopefully, they're going to get some peace and go to work knowing what to do. In other words, to make a difference. Um, you know, people are petrified today. They, they hear all these horror stories. They're taking place around them. The weather's changing. Things, life is not the same as it was. And now they can do something, something simple, not something that's going to break their back. You know, this, this is my 18th book and I got a few more to go yet, but (laughs) it's like, this is one of the most important ones because I want to take that stigma of paralysis Uh, away from people and and give them tangible evidence of how we can make a difference on a on a single level even on a family level without having to face the entirety of the beast so to speak that's you know we talk a lot with folks about how incomprehensible climate change is and it's the whole world reacting to our poor behavior in many cases and, and also to our, our uh, uh, surprising growth as a species. So you don't see this as a, as a dead end. You see this as an opportunity to walk into paradise. Oh, exactly. You see, I, you know, a lot of people will believe that it's at our core, like you said, core nature to go out there and survive and do what we can to control nature. But then you look at the cultures through the world that mm-hmm. have lived in harmony and balance with the landscape and you find that where they live, it's a totally different world. It's, it's like it's, it's uh, well-balanced. It doesn't have scars and everything else because the people have learned 
how to take care of the earth. They realize that that is their lifeblood. That is their life. And to do any damage to it is going to bring a lot of suffering. And some cultures learn it, some cultures don't, and they go extinct. You know, they, like the Mayans and, and you know, the, and so many other cultures throughout the world, they just overpopulated. Sure. They didn't take and, the right steps. And so books like Jared Diamond's Collapse uh, are excellent examples of this having happened in the past. And we face that oh, same yeah. choice now, but these small changes can start us down the right path. Yeah, exactly. And that's all we need to do is enough people believing in that. You know, you look at that saying that I said, the spirit that moves in and all th- through all things. If you look at a flock of sandpipers and you're up close, you can see the individual birds. But then when you back up and you see the whole flock going in one direction and then in a heartbeat, thousands of bellies flash to the sunlight and the whole flock changes direction. Mm -hmm. Even when they videotape and play that back in slow motion, they can find no single bird that makes that turn. Instead, they have to say, it seems like a collective consciousness that flows through that flock. That's exactly what I'm talking about. It just, it's a, a spirit that once it takes hold, we can change the course of humanity. We just got to get enough people doing it. And how many is enough? Look at it my way. One more person. You have to reach one more person. That's it. And then, well, Tom, I think you've you've definitely uh, taken the step with the book. Uh, And I want to thank you for joining us today. Uh, Do you have any last advice for folks uh, as they start their day today? The one haunting thing that always stands in my mind is what grandfather said a long time ago and said a number of times. He said, we're a society of people that kill our grandchildren to feed our children. And if we take that to heart and realize that what we're doing is really affecting our grandchildren and great grandchildren, then we might have the power to change things because we don't want to see them suffer. Well, thank you, Tom. Uh, This has been Tom Brown, Jr., who is the uh, co-author of Tom Brown's Guide to Healing the Earth. And you can find out more at uh, trackerschool.com, as well as uh, by uh, checking out the book on Earth 911's uh, uh, podcast page. Uh, Thanks, Tom. We will uh, be looking forward to speaking to you again in the future. Sure. Take care now. And folks, that's uh, Tom Brown. This is Mitch Ratcliffe, Earth 911's Sustainability in Your Ear. We'll be back with another innovator interview soon. Thanks very much for listening. Take care.